Well, this is the last week in, in the message series uh, titled Finding Success. By the way, just as an aside, this graphic is a graphic of a, a British uh, a, a Paralympic athlete, a sprinter. Someone confused him a few weeks ago for another uh, athlete who committed a terrible crime. It was, we, we made sure we didn't pick that athlete. So have you been thinking to yourself, is that? It's not. It's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. Um, the reason I picked this image is because when we find success through Christ, we are usually surprised at what success looks like, how it's accomplished, and how we, in our weakness, become strong in God. Maybe you'd like to follow along with me this morning. The message notes are found in a couple of different places for you. And I hope there's something in today's message that you can at least hold on to for this week that can make a difference for you. By the way, Mrs. Tressel, Mrs. Tressel, I just want to mention to you, your grandchildren are doing a great job. Daughters-in-law as well. Son, sons, I'm watching them. You know, I've already given up watching your husband. What's the point, right? What's the point, so... When you come to church, you don't expect the pastor to identify you and all your family among the you. That's really great. Well, we'll be talking about the pastor later, won't we? Michael Hirsch, I wonder if we can go back to the scripture that I just read for a minute. I want to walk through that for just a moment first before I get to the message notes. Uh, thank you for being flexible with me here. The scripture today really catches my attention. It has for the, the weeks leading up to this message um, to me, it's interesting to think about how the Bible can shape our lives and our minds as we think about and understand who we are and what this world is all about. I was thinking not too long ago about just how much the Bible influences what I see in the world and how I understand my place in the world. That literally, the Bible is like mental and spiritual contact lenses, my physical contact lenses I put in my eyes every morning are like a minor miracle to me. I go from everything being blurry, especially things written on pages, to everything being clear. And it's kind of an amazing moment for me. But I was thinking about how the scripture is like that for me all the time, that it shapes me and it helps me to think about who I am, but it also is a filter through which I see the world and understand my place in the world. And this morning's scripture in the book of Galatians wants to challenge us at some of the core ideas we have about who we are and how we are to live. What a more important time for us as Christians in America to think about freedom than today as we approach a national birthday to celebrate our freedom again. Freedom can mean many things to us. The scripture this morning is one of those scriptures that help to inspire those founders of this country to look and create an opportunity for people to be free and for the notion of freedom to develop and grow and change over time. Think about how much in our country that there has been change that has taken place all around the idea of freedom. The first people who could vote in our country looked like me. White, owning property. And we were the only ones that could vote. It turns out that I got a lottery ticket when I was born, a white guy born in the United States. Any time in our history as a country, if I'd been born based on the family I was in, I would, I would have the chance to vote. But we have developed over time. And then more people and more people and more people got to participate in this freedom. And we understand freedom to be the opportunity to choose, at least collectively, to participate in trying to choose who will be the ones who lead us and make decisions for us. What a powerful thing. Everyone in this room has the opportunity to participate at some point in their life as, a fa as an American citizen, that notion of freedom, freely being able to choose our leaders, in part is inspired by verses like these that speak about freedom. 
But sometimes it turns out that the notion of freedom can be misunderstood. And so the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in the ancient city of Galatia a letter, just a short letter, to try and talk about, among other things, how to behave as a follower of Christ. Because one of the great things that have been discovered is that following Christ and acknowledging the resurrected Christ led to a kind of freedom from boundaries that divided people up. You know those boundaries I'm talking about? Those labels? Social standing issues? Like whether or not you were of this religion or that religion. It turns out when you turn to Christ that there was no separation between, from the Apostle Paul's perspective, the Jew and the non-Jew. There was also no division between those who were male or female, as it says in another place in Galatians, or, or a free man versus one who was a slave, or rich or poor. There was a kind of equality in Christ, a freedom not to be bound by the Old Testament laws governing what you ate, what you wore, who you could associate with, but a freedom to say thanks to the resurrected Christ, we are free in faith through grace to be saved for eternity and to live our lives freely responding to God. You know, one of the most important notions in freedom is the ability to say no. My children have learned that word well. <laughs> I had hair down to my knees before they were born. Can you believe it? No, I'm just lying. I didn't have that much hair, but I felt like I did. When our children learn to say no, what are they learning to do? To say, this is who I am and who I will choose to be. And they have to learn when to say no and yes. Don't we all? The scripture for this morning speaks to the earliest Christians and to every generation of us Christians after those first ones and wants us to understand what is at the core of our identity as followers of Christ. And the scripture begins by saying, it is absolutely clear that God has called you and me to a free life. Free from what? He's responding. Again, like any letter, the letter to the church in Galatia is a conversation. And when we begin to read this letter, we're in the middle of the conversation, not the beginning or the end. And in the conversation that's going on between the Apostle Paul and the church in Galatia, he's talking about how we understand our relationship to God through Jesus Christ and that Old Testament law that is found in the first five books of the Old Testament that guides people to understand how to live every day, that binds them to thousands of rules, written and unwritten. And Paul says to the people in Galatia, we are free from that life of keeping track of every little thing we, we do and eat and say. But the problem is, once you get free, you have to figure out how to use your freedom, it appears. And so the scripture goes on to say, just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do. Let me stop there. What is the problem with doing whatever you want to do? Early on, one of those important philosophers that were the foundation for how we shaped our country said that our rights extend to our nose. And when we choose to violate that other person right across from us, we have taken from them their rights. So there is a kind of relationship we never get away from that freedom acknowledges. We are free to choose how to live, but have to understand we are free in relationship to other free women and men. And ultimately, we are free in relationship to the only God that is, that has created us, sustains us, and redeems us. And so again, Paul says, just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Because what happens when, when I say I am free and Rody Pipe says I am free and we begin to battle? And how far will the battle go? 
before Rhodey decides, I've had enough of this guy, and runs over me with his car. <laughs> and now my freedom's gone, and so is his. Now you say, well, that's extreme. You know human beings, right? You know our nature. We can be both extremely gracious and loving and push each other to unbelievable, inhumane acts. Don't you know that both world wars were fought by Christians? Don't you know that our civil war was fought northern Christians versus southern Christians? Let us not be confused here. The scripture today speaks to the free followers of Christ and says, watch it. You can take your freedom and lose it by not understanding what it really is, a gift of grace from God. What do we do when we realize we're free in Christ? Use your freedom to serve one another in love. This is where it challenges us, Americans, because what is our notion of freedom? Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And then in parentheses, we've added, at all costs. I don't care what it costs, I'm going to get those things. What if life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are only found when the Scripture's notion of freedom is connected to this idea that we are created with the sole purpose of serving God and serving one another? What if that is the only purpose we truly have in God? is to serve God with all of who we are, and out of that loving service, realize we should serve one another in the same way. That's how freedom grows. That's pretty powerful stuff. The scripture goes on to say, for everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. By the way, isn't that great? You don't have to read the whole Bible, just this sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. Of course, the whole problem is the rest of the Bible talks about how to understand that one sentence, so you kind of have to read the whole Bible. right? An act of true freedom. Imperfect people serving a perfect God, created to serve God and others with all of who they are, learning that freedom is figuring out how to serve one another. The scripture goes on to say in verse 15, remember... By the way, this is the reason this whole thing was written, because stuff was happening in the church in Galatia, and the Apostle Paul is becoming a referee and a father again, speaking words, fatherly words, and words of a kind of referee or umpire, and says, remember, if you bite and ravage one another, watch out, in no time at all, you'll annihilate each other, and where will your precious freedom be then? I've been saying this for a while now because I had this revelation a little over a year ago that the reason the majority of the New Testament was written was not just to expose people to the saving grace of Jesus Christ, but also to tell Christians, stop being so annoyed with each other. You're going to destroy the church. I've said it in funnier ways than that, by the way, before. but But it occurs to me that happens to be true. We We are all imperfect. I understand that. And we make mistakes. But the freedom given by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ and this resurrected Christ is to discover the joy of the truth that we are created to serve God and others. And we are intended to succeed in this faithful pursuit of freedom in Christ. How do we know when we're succeeding in faith. I have some ideas for us. First idea this morning looks like something like this. A successful faith is a growing faith. Now listen, I know some of you guys love to eat. I'm with you. 100% with you. What are some of your favorite things to eat, right? Uh, Donuts on Sunday mornings. Delicious hamburgers and hot dogs on the 4th of July, ice cream and cookies. We can kind of stop there. Ice cream and cookies. Yeah. You will know you're successfully eating your, yourself, 
your body weight in cookies when you discover your body weight has doubled, right? You can be very clear about how successful you are in your eating if your goal is to increase your physical size. You also know you're successful in eating, right? If you decide, I want to change my physique, I need to be healthier because my doctor said so. So I will change my eating habits. You can also determine that, can't you? You know, you you feel the differences. What does it look like to succeed in faith? Your faith is growing. How do you know your faith is growing? Especially when, let's be honest, as a human being, as an adult, it is very difficult to change for the better. Change is slow and incremental and gradual as an adult because when we're adults, we get pretty much set in who we are, right? And so any little change can make a big difference. And the scripture challenges us today to realize there is never a time in our life when we cannot grow in faith in Jesus Christ. The problem is growth is very slow. What does the scripture tell us about a successful faith? It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. A free life means that we are not making freedom an excuse to destroy ourselves or others. So, a successful growing faith helps us to understand we are freely choosing to say yes to God and little by little learning how to live out this faith in a way that's beneficial to God and to others. We are called to succeed in growing our faith through faithfully accepting God's grace. Second idea this morning is this. Growing faith appears in the form of loving others. We can determine we are growing in faith when we discover we are loving others more and more. My suggestion is start with what's easiest first. Right? If you're going to go to the gym with me next week, you, unless you've been working out like I have, you don't want to do the same things I do. And if you're in better shape than me, I am not going to do the same things you're doing, by the way, just letting you know. If you go to the gym, you don't want to put 500 pounds on the squat rack and try to squat down with that weight on your shoulders, which I saw someone do once, and they went, zoop. <laughs> the sound of those 500 pounds hitting the floor was enormous. It's amazing how quickly you can get every single person who works at the gym to run to your side immediately. If you want to grow physically, you take gradual steps, right? Being able to run a three-mile race, and you never run before, requires you beginning to know you can walk a certain distance and slowly run. The same thing with a growing faith. The easiest way to grow in faith by loving others is to start with what's easiest. Who are you, do you find that you're most likely to love? Who's the easiest person for you to love? That's the person to start growing in love with. Then, gradually expand your circle of love. Now don't go too quick, right? If you find you have trouble loving Cubs fans, don't do too fast. Pick one that's really lovable and move from there. Yeah, there I just saw a husband and wife, one who's a Cardinals fan, was a Cubs fan, saying, yeah, I'm starting here. Good luck to her. <laughs> Eventually, we're challenged by this freedom in Christ to say yes to Christ's challenge for us to grow beyond where we're comfortable. What an exciting thing to become uncomfortable in growth. What does the scripture say to us this morning? Use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. See, our intention is not for us to grow in terms of us gaining stuff for ourselves, but learning how to give ourselves to others, ultimately giving ourselves to God. And realizing this is an act of freedom that can grow in us. The scripture goes on to say, For everything we know about God's word is summed up in that single sentence, Love others as you love yourself. This is an act of true freedom. And this is when we begin knowing, how are we doing in faith? When we start loving others more and more, and we start loving people we knew we didn't love six months ago, a year ago, two years ago. 
What a challenge for us, right? All right, third idea this morning is this. Loving others can take many forms. It really can, right? I mentioned the Cardinal fan loving the Cub fan. That's a funny one, isn't it? You know, yeah. <laughs> yes, says the husband to the wife. I'm not sure which is the funnier part of that. There are difficult forms of loving others, right? Now, I think about how here at Cornerstone, we have been encouraging one another to love others without any regard for how those others will benefit us. Do you hear me? True love is not something where we aim to get from others. True love is where we expect to give to others. Now, we may be blessed by this relationship, but we don't expect anything in return. As we as followers of Christ practice this here at Cornerstone, we discover, we begin to really understand what it means to love others. We made a video about one of our ministries, and we've shown it once, but I wanted to show it again because it really helps us to see one of those forms of loving others that can shape how we form other ministries here at Cornerstone. So watch this video with me. Hi, I'm Pat Moore. Welcome to the food pantry. I'm a member of the 24-7 committee of our church, and today we'd like to feature the food pantry. Our theme for the year is our legacy, our history, and serving our community. And we certainly do that through our food pantry. I'd like to introduce you now to the person who heads it all, Terry Mendenhall. Um, hi, I'm Terry Mendenhall, and I head up the food pantry. I have a lot of staff that helps me, so I don't want to say that I run it. I want to let you know how it works. Okay, um, on Mondays, we go to a place called Caring and Sharing, and we get our bread, our produce, um, that kind of thing. On Wednesdays is our is our day for the for the customers. So they come in, they sign in, fill out their form, pick their produce, pick their bread. Then they come to this door. We give them uh, a bag of food, and then twice a month we give meat, and we give toilet paper out and personal products. If we have anything left over, we supply to a food pantry in Forestell. There's one in uh, North St. Charles that we give. And we also help the backpack out, food drives. We have four of them. We have, the main one is the Boy Scout drive. And we usually get between 25 and 35 piece, uh, thousand pieces. Then we also have the postal drive and shop out hunger. And then we have April Showers, which is the personals. Um, our main one is the Boy Scout Drive that we get all our items through. And then, of course, during the year, we also ask for items from the, the congregation if we're low on stuff. So to find out the history of the food pantry, we'd like to introduce Nancy Harrius. In May of 1993, my husband, George Crozier, and I were in the church office. Dallas Sermon was the church secretary. And she said, I can't leave my desk all the time to go downstairs to get food for people that come in asking for food. George and I went downstairs and found that the food was a closet. We called the trustees to see if the room outside the closet was available. And it was. And we asked Dallas, how can we get some shelves in this room? She said Harold Runyon would love to do that. So we called Harold and he came over to the church office. And I said, Harold, how much would it cost to put shelves up in this room? And he said about $80. So George and I opened our wallets and came up with almost $80. And Dallas had enough in the petty cash so that he could go get the wood to put the shelves up. 
in that room. Then we put a notice in the paper that at that time it was called Williams Memorial Church. Food pantry was open and for the last 26 years we have reached out to the community and fed those in need and I'm very proud of my church for doing that. I really love that story. I love, Dallas is here, Dallas Sherman's here, Nancy Harris is here. I don't, did I see Terry? I don't know if I've seen Terry today or not. Um, I know that uh, Mabel Dighton also was involved in the food pantry for many years. She's here in front. But I, I love this image of, of Nancy and her husband walking in to see Dallas to talk about the food pantry. And I just envisioned Dallas, if you know Dallas, she, I envisioned her at her desk with her feet propped up. She's smoking a cigarette. <laughs> And she's like, I can't go downstairs all the time to help these. <laughs> That's probably not how it went. Um, Dallas doesn't smoke, so that couldn't be it. But it just makes me chuckle to think. Here's what I really seriously am impressed about is that it took $80 out of Nancy's pockets and her, husband, her husband's pockets for them to start moving the food pantry beyond a, a hidden closet very few people knew about. And I think about how she, and, she never imagined what would happen. All of you who are volunteering now um, are, are really the, you know, the, the ongoing presence of our church back 27 year, 26 years ago when we thought, well, maybe we could do better than just have a bunch of food thrown into a closet. So you're here today, and the scripture says to you, loving others can take many forms and a successful faith is one that's growing. The way we grow is by loving others and serving others. And without knowing it, Nancy and her husband and Dallas and Terry and Mabel and all of you who volunteer have said yes to God and are changing lives in St. Charles and Lincoln County every week. Now think about this. What else is God inspiring you personally to do that would require, it might be a sacrifice up front, but could make a lasting difference for eternity. It's really possible that the form of loving others you are called to participate in will be eternal in its final reward, but will cost you very little up front. You'll just have to love someone you might not naturally love. Loving others can take many forms. Here is where the Spirit of God is working in you now. Can you hear it? Can you feel the Spirit? Can you, can you feel that movement? Are you beginning to think about how you might continue the work God is doing in you? Are you feeling that inspiration for that idea you have? to make it a reality? Or are you feeling that confirmation? Yes, you are on the right track, you are making a difference. Keep working, keep growing, keep experiencing the truth that is true freedom in Christ by serving others. Fourth idea this morning is this, the, way, the work of the church is to nurture a growing faith. What is the work of the church? Is it to make sure we're comfortable on Sunday mornings? Well, we don't want you to be so cold in here that your toes turn purple, like someone mentioned to me. We're in our renovation uh, and, um, and expansion. We've renovated our control system for heating and cooling, and we're working some kinks out. So, you know, maybe bring a fan, a paper fan, but more likely bring a blanket. We'll get, we'll get there, though. The point, though, is that the church's work is ultimately not to make sure we're comfortable in worship, although we want to be able to worship and focus on it, but our work ultimately as the church, and by the way, the church is not a building. I mean, this, again, is our, our seventh building in its fifth location, and this is our fifth name. So clearly, you know, what's more important? The people. Right? The reason we have that food pantry we just talked about is because the people of the church, the people are the church, and make what happens the church. 
So the work of the church is to nurture a growing faith. In second service today, we'll have a baptism. A little, little baby named Jack Gary is going to be here and going to get baptized. He doesn't know yet, but I'm going to try to see if I can. I used to be a Baptist. I'm going to see if I can immerse him in the <laughs> baptismal font. I've just got this urge today to do it. A beautiful little boy. And every time we baptize, we use the United Methodist uh, baptismal vows. And I wanted to show this to you for a minute here at least a part of them. This is the part the church says to the, to the family and to the one who's being baptized. We say to them, with God's help, we'll proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this one, not just the person being baptized, but the entire family, with a community of love and forgiveness. That's tough. It's tough to love and forgive. But that's because we're reflecting Christ, right? that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they will be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. This is the work of the church. Everything else is secondary. Right? Your favorite ministry that you love and you can't imagine not having here at Cornerstone, it is secondary to this. The bathroom that's in my office that's just for me that my children continue to violate. <laughs> I will give it up in a minute to make sure we do this. Right? This is who we are. This is what we're about. The church is called and created out of nothing by Christ to nurture others and one another in faith. 212 years of work here at Cornerstone. We've discovered that we've Got to forgive each other and love each other, trust in each other and God. Take a step forward, take a step back, take a step sideways, build a church building by a flooding creek, build it away from the creek because we're tired of it flooding, overcome a, a war of 1812, you know, a fire, tornado, lightning strikes, you know, all kinds of things the battles of people with people, a community that has rapidly changed in the last 50 years, all of this, because ultimately this is who we're called to be. And so everything else we have worked to overcome. The work of the church is to nurture a growing faith. Fifth idea, God is working in you, in you personally, every day to produce evidence of a growing faith. So I'm speaking to each of you today. You know, it's so easy as a, person talking here to look at the back wall and make, it think you're, make me think I'm looking at you, but I'm really not, you know? But I'm not looking above any of your heads right now. I'm looking at you. I can see you. And it's scary that you're looking right back at me. I like that. <laughs> God is working in you today, in you this moment, to produce evidence of a growing faith. How will you know and how will others know that faith is growing in you. This week, look for these signs. One, evidence of growing faith. You recognize you are building on a legacy of faith and creating your own spiritual legacy for others. Realize others who have influenced you continue to influence you. Other faithful followers of Christ are working in your heart now. And your job is to build on that legacy, not just for yourself, but for others, evidence of a growing faith. Two, you want to spiritually bless the next generations coming after you. It's so easy to say, I want what's mine. I want to get it now, whatever that is. A growing faith reflects clear concern that the next generations will be blessed by the ministry you do now. Think about that food pantry 26 years ago. Do you think that Nancy and and her husband, George, and Dallas, and those others of you who helped after that were really thinking about how you were leaving a legacy for the next generations? Maybe. Maybe you were. Three, you realize you're reaching out to others, especially those who need God's love and grace. When you discover this week, even for a moment, that you have a heart for someone else, you're concerned about someone else, that you, you, you want someone else to experience 
a kindness, the love of God, or a kind of way of realizing that, that out of your concern, others realize they too are loved by God, then you know faith is growing in you. We are challenged to find success through faith in Jesus Christ. Success looks like freedom. Freedom in Christ looks like loving God and others with all of who we are. My prayer for you is this week you will see real evidence of a growing faith. Will you pray with me? Today, God, open us up to your truth. Help us to see that when we follow your son, we are surprised that we find a success in your son we would never have anticipated or dreamed of. Help us to find evidence of a growing faith this week in us and through your church. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.